Coming up on Stu Does America, I'll speak with Dan Andros about a pretty baffling case of social media censorship against his company, Faithwire. And as the popular cliche goes, when the cat's away, the mice will sign executive legislation banning masks in the state of Idaho. We'll look at what happened there. And the media is finally starting to do some research into the COVID-19 origin. And their findings seem to point toward a theory that conservatives have been talking about forever. Surely they'll apologize for their terrible work and pledge to do better in the future. <laughs> Let's do the Wuhan hypocrisy. Ah, uh, well, it's been a heck of a year when you're talking about COVID-19. Uh, now, the virus was pretty bad. I don't know, maybe the journalism, it, it's possible it could have been worse than the actual virus itself. There's been this whole storyline about how very early on, there was a, a thought about among conservatives that maybe this wasn't just an easy, natural thing. We should look into the communist government of China. They were acting very suspiciously. They're a communist government. They've covered up all sorts of stuff in the past. Maybe there's an issue here. Let's at least look into it. Well, that was dismissed by the media. Let me give you a quick taste of what it used to look like back in the day. Those same agencies now have been tapped with investigating one of Trump world's most favorite conspiracy theories. This week, Donald Trump is still pushing the debunked bunkum, despite mm. his own intelligence community's findings that that is simply not true. And there is simply no reason to believe that that, that is the case. There is no empirical evidence to verify that. No Coming up with a conspiracy theory to try and foment xenophobia um, with respect to um, the Chinese has just as much factual support as taking Clorox. He can't just sit back and let the doctors and the scientists do their jobs. He's got to chime in. He may pick up the conspiracy theory that this was some weapon. People don't keep bats in captivity. Complete baloney. We don't need to invoke conspiracy theories. <laughs> I love they go to Al Sharpton for his Wuhan uh, you know, expertise. Uh, he's an epidemiologist, if you didn't know that. Now, it's funny because lately, now that more evidence has come uh, to the public's eye, there's been this idea that, uh, and you know, this one clip in particular from Maggie Haberman, where she talked about why the media brushed off this theory at the beginning. Watch. But we've come a long way from people dismissing this as a conspiracy theory to a lot of people taking this seriously, Maggie. We have, John. And look, I do think it's important to remember that part of the issue when this was first being reported on and discussed back a few months after the pandemic had begun was that then President Trump and Mike Pompeo, uh, the uh, secretary of state, both suggested they had seen evidence that this was formed in a lab. And they also suggested it was not released on purpose, but they refused to release the evidence showing what it was. And so because of that, that made this instantly political. I think that it was, you know, example 1000 when the Trump administration learned that when you have burned your own credibility over and over again, people are not immediately going to believe you, especially in an election year. However, that does not mean it's not worth discussing. Hmm. So it's Donald Trump's fault, basically. And people were saying, well, it's not exactly what she was saying. She wasn't saying explicitly it was Donald Trump's fault. She's just trying to give the tone. I think it's important, though, to note that she's being honest there. She's saying, like, yeah, we probably should have listened to it. However, Donald Trump said it, so we didn't listen to it. And people kind of, that clip went very viral. But she's not alone there. Let me give you a clip from um, Post Reports. This is the Washington Post's uh, podcast as they looked at the origins of COVID-19. If there's not a consensus within the intelligence community as to the origins of the coronavirus, then why was this theory dismissed at first? You could boil it down to Donald Trump. In oh. the beginning of the outbreak, former President Trump was very quick to point the finger at China as the source of the pandemic. But I think that he went farther and he wanted to attribute some kind of sinister motive to the government of China, whether it was simple negligence that maybe this thing was being experimented with in a lab and they let it get out 
or that they deliberately may have tried to concoct this virus or create it and it got out that way. And this sort of idea that China was doing something secretive and nefarious or reckless behind the scenes was one of the first rhetorical devices that the president deployed to try and arguably deflect blame off of his own administration's response. And I think within the scientific community, within certain political circles, there was an almost immediate allergic reaction to this idea of the lab leak, in large part because Donald Trump was promoting it, or people around him and other conservatives were promoting it. I, that's, a, I, that's an amazing clip of audio. They're just admitting they didn't listen to it because Republicans were saying it. <laughs> that's it. And this went very, very deep. We talked to Drew Holden. Uh, he's at Drew Holden 360 on Twitter. He had a, a, a thread of looking at the hypocrisy here. Let me give you a few examples of this. Um, New York Times. Senator Tom Cotton repeats fringe theory of coronavirus origins. That's the old story. The new story. Another group of scientists calls for further inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. CNN, we urge the U.S. to stop spreading disinformation. China says recent accusations by the Trump administration that the COVID-19 pandemic originated in a lab in Wuhan are a political strategy for Republicans ahead of the 2020 presidential election. Fast forward a few months, new information on Wuhan researchers' illness furthers debate on pandemic origins. How about the Washington Post? You just heard that last clip from them. Their fact checker said, was the new coronavirus accidentally released from a Wuhan lab? It's doubtful. However, they're updating their stories now. Timeline, how the Wuhan lab leak theory suddenly became credible. Was it sudden? Was it sudden? Politico, the Trump administration abruptly cut off funding for a project studying how coronavirus spread from bats to people after reports linked the, uh, the work to a lab in Wuhan, China, at the center of conspiracy theories about the pandemic's origins. Fast forward to uh, just the other day, and actually this one's in March. Diplomats in 2018 warned of risky coronavirus experiments in Wuhan lab. No one listened. Apparently not even Politico. Listen to that one. NPR scientists debunk lab accident theory of pandemic emergence. Scientists have dismissed the idea that the coronavirus pandemic was caused as an accident in lab. Fast forward. Theory that COVID came from a Chinese lab takes on a new life in wake of the World Health Organization uh, report. Uh, the Hill, even as the World Health Organization and others say they've seen no evidence linking coronavirus to being created in a Chinese lab, President Trump is doubling down on his efforts to blame China for the virus. Now, COVID-19 Wuhan lab theory gains more credibility. Hmm. Never, there's never the, the article that I want, which is like, by the way, we blew it last time. Here's the truth now. That one never, there's never that midpoint between those two stories. It's just it was debunked, and now it's true. There's never the point of, hey, sorry for saying it was debunked before. That never happens. Insider wrote, uh, the theory pushed by Trump that the coronavirus began in a laboratory in Wuhan is a pure fabrication, according to the lab's director. Now, three Wuhan lab workers were sick enough to go to the hospital in 2019, bolstering calls to reconsider the coronavirus lab leak theory. On and on and on and on and on and on and on. I could give you a ton of these. This is what the media was doing. And so let's look back a little bit. Was it so crazy to believe that this had gone on? Let me give you this clip. Uh, this is a clip from the Chinese government talking about their coronavirus collection uh, techniques. Among all known creatures, the bats are the most rich in various coronaviruses. You can find out most viruses responsible for human diseases, like rabies virus, SARS, and Ebola. Accordingly, the, the caves frequented by bats become our main battlefields. I mean, look how creepy this is. This is right out of a horror film. Bats all over the ceiling. It's dramatic footage. This is what they were doing. Um, they also were talking about how dangerous it was to do this kind of work. Watch. Watch out. Most bats living here are horseshoe bats. And if we keep our skin bare, we can easily get contact with the feces of bats that contaminate everything. So it's highly risky here. Highly risky. Now, this is stuff that happened before COVID came out. We knew they were doing this type of research. Let me tell you about another guy who uh, was a researcher. He was a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard. And he's working now at a university controlled by the Chinese government. He, this is a, this is, these are actual quotes that came out about COVID. Listen, 
We screened the area around the seafood market and identified two laboratories conducting research on bat coronavirus. Within 280 meters from the market, there was the Wuhan Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The WHCDC hosted animals in laboratories for research purpose, one of which was specialized in pathogen collection and identification. The expert in collection described that he was once attacked by bats and the blood of a bat shot on his skin. He knew the extreme danger of the infection, so he quarantined himself for 14 days. In another incident, he quarantined himself because bats peed on him. The WHC DC also was put into uh, adjacent to the Union Hospital where the first group of doctors were infected during this epidemic. It is plausible the virus leaked around and some of them contaminated the initial patients in this epidemic, though solid proofs are needed in future study. In addition to the origins of natural recombination and intermediate host, the killer coronavirus probably, probably originated from a laboratory in Wuhan. Safety level may need to be reinforced, uh, reinforced in high risk biohazardous laboratories. Regulations may be taken to re re relocate these laboratories far away from city centers and other densely populated places. You think? What a crazy idea. Don't put the lab in the middle of the city. I don't know. Seems like a wild theory. I will say this. That is not new information. In fact, we brought you that information on a, st on, on a uh, program that we did on this show called the Wuhan Conspiracy. It aired on April 6th, 2020. These were not Donald Trump's theories. These are actual quotes from scientists in China. Now, later on, this scientist in particular said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, probably from a lab. Uh, delete, 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 delete. It's hard to have these theories and hold, hold up uh, all the, uh, take, you know, kind of take the stand, I guess, when the cold metal is pressed to the back of your head from the Chinese government. But this was known. There were ads requesting people to come do this dangerous work. Another person who did a lot of this research at the time was Jim Garrity of National Review. He recently took kind of a, a well-deserved a, a victory lap because he was one of the main people reporting this and just saying, like, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. It's not proven. But there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. He, re he released a new story kind of going through all this evidence. We'll tweet it out from at Stu Does America. Maybe post a link uh, wherever, we, uh, wherever we can to kind of get this out there. But let me give you a little chunk of it here. On December 24th, 2019, the Wuhan Institute of Virology posted a job listing that declared, translated, long-term research of the pathogenic biology of bats carrying important viruses has confirmed the origin of bats of a major new human and livestock infectious disease such as SARS and SADS. SADS is a terrible name for a disease. It's so sad. And a large number of new bat and rodent new viruses have been discovered and identified. As Professor Richard Ebright of Rutgers University's Waxman Institute of Microbiology argued, bat coronaviruses at Wuhan Center for Disease Control and Wuhan Institute of Virology routinely were collected and studied at BSL-2, which provides only minimal protections against infection of lab workers. Now, with coronaviruses, if, if it's SARS or MERS, those are two that we knew about previous to, uh, to COVID, you had to you go to a, um, a BSL-3 facility, uh, higher, basically higher safety um, uh, issues. Like you, if you're studying HIV, you have to go to a, a BSL-3 uh, facility. BSL-2 is more like the normal flu and any coronavirus other than SARS or MERS. So this may have been in a BSL-2 facility, which is like, you gotta wear gloves. You know, I mean, it's just not serious security. Uh, the person with the earliest uh, onset of symptoms on December 1st, 2019, could not be traced back to the market. Three of the fir first four patients could not be traced back to the market. A later larger study of the first 99 people with COVID-19 found that only 49 could be traced back to the Hunan seafood market. We are left with a mystery of a virus that is spectacularly contagious among human beings and that is genetically similar to viruses found in bats and pangolins, but that is nowhere to be found in bats or pangolins. Outsiders uh, cannot enter Wuhan Institute of Virology or any other Chinese biological research facilities. When a team of the World Health Organization visited Wuhan in February 2021, more than a year after the pandemic began, Chinese officials refused to turn over raw data from the earliest COVID-19 patients. Why would they do that? And disagreements over patient records and other issues were so tense that they sometimes erupted into shouts among the typically mild-mannered scientists on both sides. The evidence is clear that they are hiding something. 
contemplate how the Chinese government treated those who told the truth about this virus in the earliest weeks and months. The Wuhan Public Security Bureau issued summons to Dr. Li Wenyang, accusing him of spreading rumors. Two days later at a police station, Dr. Li signed a statement acknowledging his misdemeanor and promising not to f uh, commit further unlawful acts. Seven other people were arrested on similar charges and their fate is unknown. What we've seen over the last year is a cataclysmic journalistic failure based almost entirely on journalists dislike for the messenger. But what is worse is the comfort they seem to find in admitting it publicly. Of course, we didn't take it seriously. The former president said it. <laughs> what are we supposed to do? And over and over again, their co-workers nod in knowing agreement. Look, I don't care if it was a lab leak or if it was a natural event or if Donald Trump cooked up COVID-19 with test tubes and sent Melania around the globe to spread it. All I want, all I have ever wanted is the truth. Well, I mean, that and a little bit of a revenge. <laughs> There's, but, but mostly all I want is the truth. There's no more important time to have a good real estate agent than when the market is going crazy like it is now. Well, it's one other time. If you're trying to buy a condo in Wuhan, then you really want a good agent that's going to say no. But other than that, you want to make sure in a, in a market like this, when you're trying to buy a house, if you're buying a house, the price is going to be inflated. You better get a good one. You better get the right price. You better not overbid. You better not do those things that people make mistakes on all the time. You better make sure your financing is lined up early and you know how to do it. You know how to please the person who's selling the house. If you're selling a house, you better exploit this uh, for every dime because this is probably the best it's ever going to be. The market is going uh, up and up and up and up. Take advantage of that. And the way you do that is have a good real estate agent on your side of the transaction. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find that person. In your area, no matter where you are in the United States, it's not available in Wuhan yet. Yet. Get more information at realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there now. Check it out. Realestateagentsitrust.com. All right. I, we're talking a little bit about today uh, Israel and the situation with Israel and Hamas. And I've said this several times, and I feel like there are certain hurdles I can't clear in my life. I can understand the left-wing argument on taxes. I think it sucks, but okay, you want to take more money from the people to redistribute. I understand what you're trying to do there. I don't understand how you're telling me the right side of the, of the conflict in Israel is the side that voted Hamas into office. A guy, it's a it's a hard barrier for me. I I can't get past that one little fact. I also have a bit of an issue when you are continually defending the side that fire, fires all the missiles first. That's another one. Seems a little strange to me. Now, this has permeated all of society, though. The media has been on the side of the Palestinians the entire time. They don't seem to really care what the facts are whatsoever. All they care about is their end game, which is to say Israel is evil over and over and over again. It's not anti-Semitic at all, but they just have to let you know Israel is evil over and over and over and over again. This has gone so far uh, that it has gone from the media to all of society, and it's probably worst right now in uh, our colleges, in our universities, all over college campuses across the country. Ami Horowitz uh, decided to go to a college campus to, and I mean this sincerely, he went there raising money for Hamas. Hamas is an internationally recognized terrorist organization. Can Ami Horowitz get money to support terrorism? Watch. We're kind of like the next level BDS. You know, it's like BDS and then we're like BDS plus. You know, we, we're looking to wipe Israel off the map. Yeah, we want, you know, we, we're looking to destroy Israel. We don't want just Gaza, we want to have all of Israel. No, I, I've actually been learning about last in this last school year about everything that's going on over there, so I, I like the sound of what you're doing. It sounds like a great thing to do. Yeah, totally against the Israeli genocide. Awesome. We just want to get rid of Israel, and you know, yeah. it's, for the, it's for the Palestinians. Stay off drugs. But we would love you to check out our website. That would be wonderful. Good luck. Thank you. If you feel like donating to help the cause, to fight back, and that'd be great. For sure, we'll definitely. And maybe consider making a donation. Sure. Great. Probably like 15 bucks. 15 bucks? Yeah. No, that'd, that'd be great. 
Maybe like 10, 20 bucks. 15 to 20. Five or $10. Or maybe like $10. $5. 10 bucks. $10. Five or 10 bucks. 10 bucks. Let's say $27 since that seems to be my Bernie donation. Oh, that's wonderful. Cash for Hamas and easy to raise if you happen to be on a college campus these days. Happy to welcome to the program Dan Andros. He's the managing editor, editor of faithwire.com. He's been doing a lot of coverage of the Israeli the Hamas battle as it's been going on over the past couple of weeks. Dan, welcome to the program. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you heard the, the Yami Horowitz video, which is just completely insane. This has permeated so deeply in our society. And if you try to tell the truth about what is going on with Hamas in, in the area, you get hit uh, on social media, you could get deplatformed, you can get restricted. You guys have been writing about this honestly here for a while, trying to tell the truth of this region. And you guys have faced social media censorship. Can you walk us through the story? Yeah, we got uh, dinged with a false information label. Now, this was the first time uh, in Faithwires, which CBN is our parent company, but Faithwire, uh, it's the first time in five years that we've gotten any, you know, misinformation labels. So we're very careful in what we do. Uh, and not to say that these misinformation labels are accurate, as this latest one uh, clearly was not. So uh, we took note of the Black Lives Matter tweet that went out expressing solidarity with Palestinians. Now, mind you, they put this tweet out in the midst of Hamas firing rockets at Israel, and then Israel in turn then defending themselves. So this was in the middle of this uh, rocket volley happening back and forth, which as you know, it was started by Hamas. Um, and they, tweet, they tweeted out solidarity in that. Now, we said in our headline, because uh, some other people noted solidarity, and they just said solidarity with Hamas. Now, they don't say the word Hamas in their tweet, right. but so we said effectively, because effectively, that's what they're saying. They're say in the middle of this fight between Hamas and Israel, they're tweeting out their support to Palestinians. Now, all the fact checkers then leapt to the defense of Black Lives Matter and said, well, uh, this is false information. They didn't claim that at all. And uh, hmm. so we got pinged. We got pinged with a with a warning. So let me understand here. So your headline says Black Lives Matter effectively tweets a support for Hamas. Hamas, of mm -hmm. course, is the elected government of the Palestinians. OK, so this is not some yeah. crazy idea. It's not some unrelated group. No, uh, they are. They are the ones launching the missiles in the time of the battle. They tweet that you say not that they did it explicitly, but that they effectively did it which I think is completely accurate, and you guys get dinged. And, that, and, and, and you know, I, some of the, sometimes I think, like, these stories don't relate to the average person because, the, you know, they might not care if they get dinged uh, and they lose, uh, you know, what does that matter uh, on a social media account? Well, if you're a conservative media company, it matters a lot because yeah. your revenue, your page views, the people who are going to, if, if you're going to get any reach on your stories, you can't have these strikes against you. It devastates your business. Right. And and also to your reputation. And so, you know, just like think about the covid story with the Wuhan lab leak, everyone that got smeared by sharing false covid information that the implication here is that this is an untrustworthy source and that they're giving you false information. And uh, and so that's that's the imagery that they're trying to put on there. And that has a big effect on, I mean, clearly informed audiences like uh, yours do are not going to fall for something like that. But a lot of people who are just kind of sk skimming headlines uh, will. So it is damaging uh, to your reputation, to the, to your reputation when they do something like this. And um, and to, to bolster, by the way, our effectively headline, we also included a um, statement from Black Lives Matter New Jersey, which they took it a step further. They also didn't say Hamas, but they said uh, that they um, they tweeted the condemnation to, quote, ongoing violence against Palestinians, end quote. And they said they stand in solidarity, quote, with those fighting the occupation. Mm. Uh, and so what I ended up doing, one of the additions I made to the article uh, so that they would remove this label, I said, I put that quote there. And then I put, according to NPR, rocket attacks began when Hamas fired long range rockets towards Jerusalem in support of Palestinian protests. <laughs> so juxtaposed right next to each other, I put Black Lives Matter New Jersey saying we support anyone fighting the occupation and then Hamas saying we're fighting the occupation. Mm. I, I don't know how this could possibly be considered false information, but but the fact checkers, by the way, did 
remove the label once we updated the story, which is so infuriating. It's kind of soul crushing because we didn't even bother to try to fight it. Um, but we didn't issue a correction either. We just updated the story and we reworded things like that. So kind of said the same thing, but we didn't use the word uh, Hamas. Let's let, let, let's go behind the curtain a little bit here, because th this is the process. This is the process the news goes through these days. If you write Black Lives Matter is perfect and a wonderful organization and a great, bunch of great people and definitely not their their founder is definitely not embezzling money and siphoning it off to other people and buying houses <laughs> all across the country. Right. If you write that, you're not going to get dinged. You're not going to have any nope. false uh, accusations against you. If you go the other way and say, hey, this is really what's happening. You get this stuff all the time. So so they come to you. Is it was it Facebook? Um, it well, was, yeah, fa Facebook's using in, independent fact checkers right. so, too. But Facebook's uh, the so one that USA called you Today, out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Facebook okay. then, you know, well, I, I don't really know how their algorithm works, but who you deal with is a fact checker from USA Today. And I think AFP was the other one. Mm -hmm. And so they come to you and they say, hey, uh, we don't like your story. We're not going to, they're not trying to necessarily get into an argument with you about it. They're saying like, we're going to ding you unless you change it to something we like. And if you, yeah, change, if you change it to something we like, we might let you out of, out of Facebook jail. You, you have two options. You can, you can fight it. It says, here's your options. You can fight it and try to say that the fact checkers were wrong, uh, or you can update your story. Uh, and so we were just like, you know, I think most people don't even care about our, you know, they don't believe the, <laughs> the uh, misinformation label. I mean, we think our audience gets it. So our choice was just to update the story the best way we could so that it still said what we were trying to say, but also fit their little parameter um, and and just figured, let's do that and just move on with it, get the false label removed and then move on. And they did remove the label after we updated the story. But but that is it's amazing because the the pressure they put on people to, like you said, get out of Facebook jail or Twitter jail is really something else and they can shape narratives there uh, because if you think about what they're actually doing they were leaping to the defense of black lives matter the onus should be on black lives matter to uh to denounce hamas and clear up any confusion on their tweet now remember did anyone leap to the defense of president donald trump when it came to fact checkers uh, on charlottesville when he said um there were very fine people on both sides. Now I condemn the white, you know, supremacists and the white nationalists, but there were very fine people on both sides. No, everyone that claimed that Donald Trump was a white supremacist, no one filled in the dot for Donald Trump on that one. Absolutely no one. You, I don't think anyone got warnings and misinformation warnings for that, right. but yet that lie is still out there today. And this is such so a just, common, yeah, it's a common tactic too, where they will take your words on the right, uh, if you're conservative, they take them as literally as, as humanly possible to try to yeah. nail you on a small point where they can be very broad. They could say, Donald Trump will not uh, denounce white supremacism. If you say, well, here's the 10 times he did that, they'll say, oh, well, he didn't do it this time. And then yeah. somehow that gets by the fact checkers. It's It's got to be incredible incredibly frustrating to be running a site trying to tell the truth these days. Yeah, well, hopefully I, I hopefully someone out there chuckled at uh, my editor's note, which we did send to these fact checkers, which reads, while certain editors know, while certain BLM chapters were more bullish than others in their support of Palestinians, this report has been updated to provide a more literal reading of BLM's tweet. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, well, again, if you said BLM literally... Uh, tweets support for Hamas, it probably would have been a misleading headline. Although still pretty much true, it would have been a misleading <laughs> right. headline. You yeah. said effectively, uh, which I think communicates what you're saying. Like they're not, they're not actually coming out and saying it, but they're coming damn close. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we were, that was our choice. We were like, we could plead that case because I think we just got lumped in with a couple other outlets like Fox News and, and, and some others who had said in solidarity with Hamas. They didn't have effectively. We did. Um, so I was like, we could probably win that, but it just wasn't worth the hassle. Yeah. I just, we just figured let's just bite the bullet and do what we can and move on. But all right. But well, they get the win, though. They get the win. They get to say Faithwire corrected their story, which we never <laughs> said we did. We updated it. He just updated it. OK, uh, yeah. sit tight, Dan. There's a few more things I want to talk to you about on the other side of the break. Uh, we'll be back with more from Dan Andrus of Faithwire.com in just a second. You know, if you ever watch this show and you're like, why is the host so out of shape? 
Uh, it's a good question, and it's actually one uh, our previous guest, Dan Andrus, largely responsible for, considering uh, he's been my friend for my whole life, and you know, the entire time we were younger, all we did was eat junk food all the time. So these habits were formed a long time ago. I w we gotta get some built bars and send them to Dan Andros because Dan has never eaten anything healthy before. Um, and this is actually healthy, but it's actually delicious too. Tons of different flavors out there of built bars. We're talking about, don't tell Dan, high in protein, low in calories, low in carbs, high in fiber. These things are good for you and they actually taste good too. All sorts of great flavors, cookies and cream, caramel brownie, raspberry, all sorts of different stuff. They have tons of flavors and they release new ones all the time. I know they have a new birthday cake one out as well. You can check it out at builtbar.com. Use the promo code STU15 to save 15% off your next order. The promo code STU15 for 15% off at builtbar.com. Builtbar.com, promo code STU15. Back with Dan Andros, managing editor of FaithWire.com, a uh, big basketball fan as well. Uh, and I've yeah. been fascinated at watching uh, the NBA, I don't know, destroy itself over trying to be the most woke league in the universe. Um, here's a clip from Kyrie Irving. He's on the Brooklyn Nets, a team that if they don't win the championship with the amount of players they've acquired, I, it's never going to happen, Brooklyn, uh, fold the franchise. But here's <laughs> Kyrie Irving uh, talking about going back and playing against Boston much. It's not my first time being an opponent in, in Boston. Uh, so, you know, I'm just looking forward to competing with my teammates. And, um, you know, hopefully we can just keep it strictly basketball. You know, there's no belligerence or any racism going on, subtle racism and people yelling shit from the crowd. Um, but even if it is, it's, it's part of the nature of the game. And we're just going to focus on what we can control. Oh, he's so tough. He'll just ignore that subtle racism if it happens to go on. Now, of course, Kyrie Irving used to play for the Boston Celtics. Dan, you're a Celtics fan. Uh, how do you feel about this? There are so many places I could begin on this. First of all, the Kyrie tenure in Boston was a frustrating one. Um, <laughs> not to, And then it ended with a, a string of him if you recall, talking with Kevin Durant at the All-Star Game, I defended him at the time going, oh, come on, they're just friends. They're not talking about teaming up and forming a super team. They couldn't be talking about that. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. <laughs> well, and then he went and did it. So it turned out to all be true. He's mm -hmm. a total idiot. Um, so <laughs> not that I'm bitter or anything. For, no, it doesn't sound it. Fan. Definitely doesn't sound uh, it. And then when he completely gave up in his last series with the team against Milwaukee and missed 400 shots he wasn't even trying on. So n never mind all of that. But yeah, this claim of racism is bizarre, as if somehow he was just basically having crosses burnt in his yard all the time when he lived in Boston, uh, which, by the way, is like the fifth most progressive city in the country. So if we're to believe that progressives are super woke, um, I don't think it's like this big. It's not like he's in Mississippi or something in 1955. <laughs> um, so uh, and uh, Danny Ainge uh, reacted to his comments saying, I've never heard that from any player here before. Uh, and in fact, Kyrie Irving himself in 2019 said he'd never experienced <laughs> racism before. So I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, I don't know either. He doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't know anything about Israel and Palestine. He doesn't know anything about whether the earth is round. He has all <laughs> sorts of issues. Uh, knowledge gaps, we'll call them. We'll call them knowledge <laughs> gaps here for Kyrie Irving. Um, he's learning. Yeah, he's learning. He's learning. Uh, not the only thing going on in the NBA now. Um, there's... <laughs> There was an incident the other night, Russell Westbrook, uh, now of team number 61 uh, in his <laughs> career, uh, the Washington Wizards, uh, got a little injured, was walking off the court, and this happened. Let's watch the clip. They were leading him off the floor. Fans, come out and cheer, come out and boo, yell all you want. We encourage that. This is just plain stupidity. Wow. Somebody pouring some popcorn, and any athlete, being Westbrook or whomever, they are pumped with their adrenaline. He's probably feeling bad. His team may be en route here to losing this game, too. Just a stupid thing to do. <laughs> so someone d dumps popcorn at his, at, on his head. This, of course, obviously was in Philadelphia. Because of where course. else would it be, obviously? <laughs> As an Eagles fan, I can say that and not be judged. Uh, the 76ers did make a statement. Here it is. After an investigation into the incident that occurred at last night's game, we have determined that the person involved will have his season ticket membership revoked, effective immediately. In addition, he will be banned from all events at Wells Fargo Center indefinitely. We apologize to Russell Westbrook and the Washington Wizards for being subjected to this type of unacceptable and disrespectful behavior. There is no place for it in our sport or arena. I mean, I guess they handled that the right way. 
I think so. I mean, look, it's a despicable. I mean, what are you doing? You know, just don't. I mean, it's dangerous. First of all, I mean, the player doesn't know. I mean, who knows what they somebody could put anything in something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so you have no idea like what's even in the, even those. Oh, it's just popcorn. I, you know, I don't I don't think so. I think putting anything down is is not only is it disrespectful, but I think it's dangerous as well. And I think um, I don't know. No, I would never, ever consider even thinking about doing something like that. And the person I think who did it, I don't know who it was, but they looked like a middle aged like guy. I don't know. <laughs> You know, it wasn't like some kid or something. It was all, you know, some college idiot who was drunk. Like you could at least maybe say like, you know, sins of our youth type of deal. Uh, but it didn't look like it was that. And so I, I think it was a despicable move. I think they did the right thing uh, because you got to make people think twice, you know, about doing something like that. And just giving them a slap on the wrist is not going to do it. But if people are like, oh, wait, I'm going to get banned from all these events uh, if I do this, uh, then uh, then I think it I think it was a good move. And also. Aside from all the other reasons of it being a dumb move, it's Russell Westbrook. That guy could tear you apart and <laughs> in a in a second, and he doesn't seem like he'd have any qualms in doing so. So it's like, what are you trying to get killed? Like, you're insane. Well, that's why you do it from an elevation, Dan. Uh, you're protected. <laughs> and <then> run. <laughs> so, <laughs> He's protected. So brave. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's obviously uh, not a good thing to do. I think, the, you know, the punishment fits the crime in this sense. I mean, look... There was no injury that happened, but still, you can't be doing that, and you have to treat it seriously as an arena. You really, there is absolutely no excuse for pouring something on a player, of course, unless it's LeBron James, then totally justified <laughs> by anyone who does it. No, I don't. Uh, uh, by the way, LeBron James, I, I, I didn't know this about him. There's something interesting about LeBron James, and I can't believe this is from NBC Sports, who's who's figured this out or at least uh, highlighting it. It is one of these things where. You look at LeBron James, he's constantly commenting on social issues uh, all the time. And he never knows. He never knows what he's talking about. I mean, I find it remarkable how often he's just a complete moron. And he tries to give you this impression that he's this intellectual all the time. He's constantly, you know, he's obviously, he's helped uh, with schools, but he didn't go to college. And I think this is kind of in his, in his head from, from back then and that he has to kind of show that he's a self learner. Uh, he's not a moron. He promises he's not a moron. However, NBC noticed this thing, which is LeBron James is often photographed reading books. However, almost every book picture that LeBron is in LeBron is reading the first page of the book. <laughs> over and over again, he's just seen in these photos, I swear I'm reading this book right now, but he's always on page one. Over and over and over again. Do we think LeBron James can read then? I mean, I don't know. I mean, he can maybe I guess he can read the first page. I mean, I still remember the Malcolm X question. They said, so what do you think of the book so far? And he was like, he was dumbfounded that someone asked him a question on like the actual substance of the book. And he was like, he's a smart man, smart guy. That's mm. what I'm learning from this. This guy knew what he was talking about. Did he? You know, like, Did Malcolm X really know what he was talking about? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, if you're a revolutionary, I guess. But yeah, I mean, that is a funny observation. I'm surprised that NBC pointed it out. It is in interesting in that, you know, LeBron James is one of these guys that makes these big sweeping statements about race, about police, about all sorts of different things, and is so used to being immune from follow-ups, he's stunned when it happens. Like, it happened with China. You know, when he came out yeah. and basically said, yeah, come on, we can't we can't bust on China. What are they doing? They're just executing some people. No big deal. Uh, it was just, that's a paraphrasing of what he said. Uh, but <laughs> he actually got a little pushback from that. And it was like he clammed up. He was turtle inside a turtle shell. Did no longer want to talk about it. It's, it's a distraction. Same thing happened when he threatened the life of a police officer, basically, by saying that the, the audience should go get him. Um, when he got pushed back on that, it was deleted. And I don't want to be a distraction. I'm not going to, no further comment on that. He's able to run his mouth constantly, kind of on his own schedule, and no one ever holds him to it. Right, when he gets caught. And then on the China thing, when he got called out on that, he just said, look, uh, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You don't have all the information. I'm just going to leave it at that. Like, wait a minute, you can't do that. <laughs> like, you just got busted. Yeah. You know, completely owned there. And now you just say like, well, you don't have the information, so 
I can exonerate myself, but I'm not going to because right. it'll just be better to drop it. But trust me, <laughs> trust me, I would on have this one. totally had a good explanation for why I'm supporting this country that you know makes people work in factories like sardines and pays them nothing and then rounds them up when they don't agree with the communists. Totally fine there. You know, I've got a legit explanation. Ah, oh, sure he does. Spare it. Uh, and this is why, of course, we made the brand new T-shirt. Dan, we have to send you one of these. Uh, yes. On the front of it, it says, don't be an idiot. Don't be a LeBron. Very uh, nice. You have not only the T-shirt, I think you might actually appreciate the mug as well, Dan. We might have to send you one of those as well. One side, it says, don't be an idiot. On the other side, it says, don't be a LeBron. These are available now at don't be a LeBron.com. <laughs> so we'll get those out to you as soon as possible. Do you have a house wrap of that too? Like, and I put it around my house, you know, like uh, just make it like instead of my siding, it's just like the don't be a LeBron. <laughs> you know, I, we hadn't considered that, but I think this could be a money making uh, opportunity for the show. So we'll get it right on that. Dan Andros, managing editor of faithwire.com. Make sure to check out their site and their YouTube channel as well. And you can get Dan Andros on Twitter at Dan Andros. Dan, thanks so much for coming on the program. All right. Thanks for having me. Now, something that goes on a little bit more than you'd realize is occasionally the governor of a state will hand over control of the state to the lieutenant governor. You know, the concept is pretty obvious. If someone's out of the state or out of the country, you want to have someone who's there and can handle any emergencies that pop up. This is not a time to change policies. Um, What's amazing about what happened in Idaho is you have a governor, Brad Little, and a lieutenant governor, uh, Janice McGeechin, and she, they're kind of rivals, right? They were not elected like on a ticket, like a president, vice president ticket. They were elected separately and they don't really like each other that much. Uh, McGeechin is kind of going for the Trump angle of the party and Little is kind of more of like an old school uh, Republican slash conservative. And so what happens? Well, Little leaves the state McGeechin, the lieutenant governor, gets control of the state and decides to pass an executive order. The executive order basically bans, um, <laughs> bans uh, public schools, municipalities, and state entities from requiring masks. Now, this isn't uh, uh, something that's totally out of line with the way that Brad Little does things, but it puts him in an impossible position because obviously it's probably not the right thing to do for the lieutenant governor to step in on like a one day uh, power grab and put a major piece of uh, a major executive order through. On the other hand, what's the, what's Little going to do when he comes back? Reverse it? So I mean, he's not going to want to reverse uh, a, a mask ban. He's going to look terrible with the people of Idaho. Obviously, a very bright red state. Looks like they might battle in the primary. We don't know, but it's kind of an amazing story in a year of absolutely amazing stories. Back in a second. Whether it's for work or play, a lot of us are going to be on the move again this summer. So take your Raycons with you. Raycons are wireless earbuds. They're way better than the Apple ones. And any other time you've, any other time you've uh, tried uh, some other brand, you're going to get crisp, powerful beats at half the price. And you can listen to this awesome podcast because they look great and they feel even better. They fit flush to your ear. They don't dangle down below like you look like you have earrings on or something like the Apple ones do. Uh, they don't fall out of your ear all the time. They just come in a great range of colors. They look really good. They sound fantastic. Whether you're listening to a podcast, an audiobook, uh, great music, uh, your Raycons are going to be the thing that you love and they cost a lot less than, let's say, Apple uh, earbuds. Uh, Raycon's offering 15% off all their products. For our listeners right now, go to buyraycon.com, B-U-Y raycon.com. Uh, there you get 15% uh, off if you go to buyraycon.com slash stew, buyraycon.com slash stew. One thing to remember this Memorial Day weekend, don't be an idiot, don't be a LeBron. Shirts are available now. Mugs are available now at don'tbealebron.com or you can get all of our merchandise at stewdoesmerch.com. In all seriousness, have a great uh, weekend with your family. Remember who's sacrificed for us. We will see you Tuesday.